ever-evolving quest to complete the principle on which we were founded, namely, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is no mere shibboleth. This is no mere motto. This is a standard by which the framers set up, knowing it would convict them. Nothing has ever been done in history like that before that the framing of a country would set up a standard of morality and a standard of what a government should be uh, formed about knowing that we were still falling short when we stood up for it. Those of us who adhere to the cause of the unborn attempt by education, persuasion, and law to expand the promise of the Declaration of Independence to more and more of those yet unborn. For we hold along with the framers that it is those who are created who are endowed with certain inalienable rights, the foremost of which is life. There are a number of valuable bills before you this year that expand the rights of the vulnerable unborn. Each of them is good, and each of them has a good and useful place in this quest. All of them I have long urged should be accorded approval. All of them. None should stand in the way of the other. The one before you, HB 125, the heartbeat bill, is the most valuable for protecting the lives of the unborn. With this law, I say unhesitatingly, there is much to gain and nothing to lose. Let me explain. First, for the first time in our history, this bill establishes that fetal heartbeat is the key medical predictor that an unborn human individual re reach viability and live birth. This is a momentous milepost on the way to protecting the unborn. Second, absent a medical emergency, it requires that the physician test for a fetal heartbeat, and if the physician find one, inform the pregnant woman that the fetus she is carrying possesses a heartbeat and that the chances of the child reaching term are very high. Third, it moves the timeline of protection of the unborn forward by prohibiting abortions after a heartbeat is detected. Now, some say, that we should not pass a bill that a court might disallow, that we should only pass bills that we are sure will be upheld. Frankly, I must say that this is a strange way of protecting the unborn. It surrenders to the status quo. There is no victory in allowing the vast majority of unborn humans to remain totally at risk. Besides, as Dr. Wilkie has pointed out, such a stand pat strategy flies in the face of history. Courts never change their minds unless they're invited to. In 1995, this General Assembly passed a bill banning partial birth abortions, the first in the nation, struck down by a federal court. But Nebraska did not stand pat. It passed its own bill prohibiting partial birth abortions. In the year 2000, it was struck down by the Supreme Court. But Congress did not stand pat. In 2003, Congress passed a federal ban on partial birth abortions and invited the court to change its mind. The court did so. And now Gonzalez versus Carhartt is the law of the land and partial birth abortions are against the law. Some years back, Akron passed a law requiring informed consent, a waiting period, and parental consent for minors seeking an abortion. The Supreme Court said that Akron's law was unconstitutional. But other states did not stop inviting the court to change its mind, and the court did. Now Ohio and most states have laws requiring informed consent, a waiting period, and parental consent on notifications. It used to be that restrictions on abortion had to pass a strict scrutiny test. Now they have to pass a somewhat lesser unbur undue burden test. It used to be that courts would routinely strike down entire statutes limiting abortion if they could find one part that was objectionable. The Supreme Court has changed that. It used to be that pro-life protesters could be sued under the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, RICO. But invited to look at what the courts were doing, the Supreme Court in 2006 unanimously denied the application of RICO to pro-life protesters. Congress did not stand pat when it passed the Infant Born Alive Act. Congress did not stand pat when it passed the Unborn Victims of Crime Act, and many states have done the same and more. Now, the Supreme Court has said that the state's interest in protecting the unborn life becomes compelling when the fetus has, quote, the capability of meaningful life outside the mother's womb. 
And at the present time, the Supreme Court has stated that that point in time is around viability. This bill invites the courts to look at an earlier point in time as more medically definable than viability and more statistically relevant to the survivability of the infant. To begin with, the viability line is not as definite as one might think. It can be between 20 and 24 weeks, depending on a number of factors. If you look in the medical literature, there is no consensus as to when viability begins. And a child born prematurely cannot survive on its own. Even when it's born, it can't survive on its own. It could only survive on its own when it's 13, when you don't want them to survive on its own. <laughs> but with cardiac activity, it either is or it isn't. It starts or it doesn't start. There's no vagueness as to whether the lungs are, are, are developed quite enough or, so, or not. It is definite, one point in time. Now, the viability line is also completely illogical. Listen how the court has done this. The court has said that once a child can survive outside the mother's womb, the state can require her to keep it. That sounds strange right off the bat, doesn't it? But if it can't survive outside of her womb, then she can get rid of it. That's backwards. One would think that if a state has an interest in protecting potential life, as the court has put it, it should be able to require that it be protected before viability in the only way it can be protected, by continuing to have it nurtured in the mother's womb. Conversely, if the child could survive outside the mother's womb, why should she be forced to keep it? Yet the court has struck down laws that would allow pregnancy termination procedures most conducive to the survivability of the infant. The rule cries out for a more rational revision. If meaningful life means the ability to survive outside the mother's womb, it is most affected by a prediction of when the baby has the best chance of being carried to term and a safe birth. Full term birth is the best guarantee of being able to survive outside the mother's womb. The best predictive moment in time is the moment of cardiac activity. Recent scientific studies have indicated that after heartbeat, the fetus has a 90% more ch or more chance, actually probably closer to 95 or 96 by the recent studies, of survival to live birth. Without the detection of a, of a heartbeat, the, the, the percentages are almost exactly reversed. Now we must remember this, that this scientific evidence was not available to the court in Roe v. Wade. This scientific evidence was not available at the time of Casey versus Planned Parenthood. These are recent longitudinal studies in the medical literature. Thus, this is the time for another new invitation, like so many that have been accepted in the past, for the court to adjust its position in the light of modern scientific evidence and allow for more protection of the unborn. This will not be an old argument trotted out that's been shot down in the past. This is a new argument, a new argument based on new, newly codified scientific evidence. Now, let's get realistic. If the courts at the present time decline this invitation, this bill still remains a victory for life. First, because of Ohio's severability statute, revised code 151, the section of the bill requiring testing and informed consent of the woman will remain in effect. And it will have a significant effect. Everyone knows that when an entity has a heartbeat, it is unquestionably a living being. And when a woman is informed of the very high chances that this living human being within her will be carried safely through pregnancy to birth, it must surely help her to make a more considered judgment of what she shall do. Moreover, as Professor Michael New of the University of Alabama has shown through sophisticated statistical studies, such statutes like parental consent laws have a ripple effect not only lessening abortions by those directly affected, but in educating others of what an abortion truly entails. Second, even if a court does enjoin the part of the bill that would forbid abortions subsequent to detection of a heartbeat, that bill does not die, but remains parked, if you will, 
to be revived or re, uh, enact, re, uh, restarted when the Attorney General determines that precedents have changed to allow the bill to go into effect. This is what's known as a trigger clause. And it is, um, let the record show, on line 795, 793 to 807 of the bill, which are not now underlined, and I think the procedure is that they need to be underlined by committee uh, rule for it to be adopted. With the trigger clause in effect, if the precedents change, we won't have to pass this bill all over again. It will have already been done. Now, all of us, and of course you in this room, know that the most ephemeral thing in politics is legislative majorities. There is no way to tell whether in four or six years there will be a pro-life majority in the legislature. Pass this bill now and to have it ready to be brought into effect by word of the Attorney General if that is necessary, then to try to pass it all over again from scratch at a time in the future when we don't know who will be in the legislature. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, I say this bill has much to gain and nothing to lose. At the minimum, the heartbeat testing and informed consent provisions should have a direct and indirect effect of saving hundreds of lives. And based on Ohio's abortion statistics, if the full bill goes into effect and is upheld either now or revived at a later date, many more thousands could be saved. So this is simply a good time to act. The capability of protecting more innocent life is in our hands now. This is our heartbeat moment, if you will, when what we do can have a lasting effect for years and years to come. Let this moment not pass us by. Thank you. Certainly, Mr. Chairman. We will never get the courts to move off the viability line unless we give them a reason to do so. To stay put at this point, while there's a pro-life majority, to move this, the line forward in the protection of the unborn, I think is much too conservative. This bill, for the first time, gives the courts a scientifically based reason to reconsider the viability line. And it will not be the only bill. Number one, if it gets enjoined by a local court, the bill is parked. It gets ready to go again if the precedents change. Other states are coming along with the same bills. This is what happened with partial birth abortion. We continue to knock at the door. We continue to knock at the door. The door will never be opened unless we knock at it. It won't be opened by itself. The Supreme Court justices are not going to wake up one morning and say, let's change our mind on Roe v. Wade. We wouldn't want them to. We want a real case. That's what they're there for. And this presents a real case and saves the bill for future reenactment 